Good morning. Thank you for having me once again. I, well, me and my wife and my family enjoyed our fellowship last time we came. So thank you once again for inviting us over to worship with you and for allowing me to share the word of God. As Pastor Rory mentioned, the sermon that uh, the passage of scripture we'll be looking into this morning comes from Psalm 115, where God's word reads, not, on, not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but to your name give glory, because of your mercy, because of your truth. Why should the Gentiles say, so where is their God? But our God is in heaven, and he does whatever he pleases. Their idols are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. They have mouths, but they do not speak. Eyes they have, but they do not see. They have ears, but they do not hear. Noses they have, but they do not smell. They have hands, but they do not handle. Feet they have, but they do not walk. Nor do they mutter through their throat. Those who make them are like them. So is everyone who trusts in them. O Israel, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. O house of Aaron, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. You who fear the Lord, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. The Lord has been mindful of us. He will bless us. He will bless the house of Israel. He will bless the house of Aaron. He will bless those who fear the Lord, both small and great. May the Lord give you increase more and more, you and your children. May you be blessed by the Lord who made heaven and earth. The heaven, even the heavens are the Lord's, but the earth he has given to the children of men. The dead do not praise the Lord, nor any who go down into silence. But we will bless the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. Praise the Lord. Let's pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, creator of things seen and unseen, holy, holy, holy. We pray, God, that you be with us this morning, that your truth, Lord God, that your word would be expounded upon, that your wisdom would be shared and not my own. We pray, Lord God, that your Holy Spirit move amongst us, Father, and have a work in the life of your people. We pray, Lord God, that we bring your word for your honour and glory. In Jesus' name, Amen. So there's not much told to us about the, the context or the setting of this passage. We don't know who the author is. We don't fully know when it was written. It could have been, you know, post-exile or pre-exile. We don't know um, the exact setting or time. We don't even fully understand the purpose of what was happening to Israel at the time that this psalm was penned. But the psalm does a great job at telling us when to use it and how to use it. It's even taught that this psalm was used during Passover. So it's constantly used as a psalm of praise and a remembrance to praise God. And that's where our psalmist begins in verse 1. He draws the people to, uh, of Israel or of the church to make an appeal or a call to God. In verse 1, he says, Not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but to your name give glory. He appeals for glory to be directed to God. And not only that, but he appeals to God to direct glory to himself. And what is the basis of this appeal? What is the reasoning? What, what is the, the foundation of why God should you know, heed to this appeal and to bring glory to himself? It is due to the character of God, his mercy and his truth. You see, the psalmist is leaning on the grace and the loving kindness and the favour of God. The, the actions of the works of God that depict these things. He's saying, for, for your mercy, for your loving kindness and for the, the favour that you show God. Let, let glory be directed to you. Going on, the next characteristic is the truth. 
His promises, the promises of God, the faithfulness of those promises, and the, the rightness of God, or the, the truth of God as in the, the correctness of God. It is for His truth. It is the fact that He is honest. It is the fact that He doesn't change, that He is the same yesterday and today and forever. He's unchangeable. He's immutable. For this reason, let glory be directed to you. And this glory is, is respect. This glory is honour. Let it be directed to you, God. They are calling for God to be glorified. But why? Why does the psalmist begin this um, psalm calling on God to give himself glory? In verse 2, the psalmist writes, Why should the Gentiles say, Where is their God? At this point in time, as I said, we don't know the exact situation or context of what was happening to Israel. But we understand that they were being persecuted, that there were those around them saying to them, where is your God? And not in, in an intellectual way, not in a way of you know, trying to find an understanding or trying to come and have a you know, contention or a discussion of the faith, but in mock and jest. The heathen is saying, where is your God? And this question only comes in certain times, doesn't it? This question doesn't arise when the church is going through a time of um, prosperity. This question doesn't arise when there are souls being saved, when there is revival, when people or young children are being baptized or adults are being baptized. This question doesn't come when the church is being sanctified, when the church is working in the world. No, this question arises when it seems like God is not near. This question comes when there is struggle, when there is trial. See, this question arose in the passage that Pastor Roy had read for us with the three companions of Daniel, where King... Nebuchadnezzar says to them, and who is this God that can save you? Saying to them before he casts them into this fiery furnace, where is your God? This question came when Moses and the Israelites were fleeing Egypt. And they come and they hit the Red Sea and they seem to be trapped and behind them, Pharaoh and the greatest army that could be conceived of in that time is chasing them on horseback and chariot with sword and arrow. Men built, fit, trained and ready for war. Coming after a, a small, weak Israel. It is that time Israel looks at Moses and says, Moses, what have you done? You have brought us to our death. Where is our God? Or well, Paul and Silas, as they, they sit in a prison cell, as they sh uh, are shackled and chained and bound in filth and dirt, in a cold, wet and damp cell. And those persecuting them, those judging them, those that had them cast into prison are probably sitting at home with their families in the comfort of those that they love saying to themselves, we've got them, we've got Paul and Silas, we've chained them, there's nothing they can do now, now where is their God? Church, I've been through instances in my own life you know, when my daughter was born and she was in ICU and the doctors had, had come and gotten me and my wife and they'd taken us into this room and they'd sat us down and they had said to us, you know, you don't know what your life's going to be like with your daughter, Rhea. You don't know what her quality of life is going to be. She's not going to be like your son. She's not going to be able to run around and play. So it's best that, that 
you know, we just kill her. We just let her go. And as me and my wife had, you know, responded and I'd said, no, all children are a blessing from God. She was, you know, created the way she was for a purpose and she was given to us by God as her parents to love and protect and to provide and to raise her. Pretty much their response was, yeah, a lot of people let God get in the way of their decisions here. Pretty much saying, where is your God now? Church, many of you are going through your own trials and struggles. There are many here that are probably thinking to themselves that very question or hearing it from family or friends around them. Where is your God? The psalmist responds to this question. And I want us to take note, he doesn't respond, as I said, in an intellectual way. He doesn't respond in a way where he doesn't want to tread on anyone's toes. He doesn't respond in a way where he wants to sort of, you know, bring them in or persuade them to come around to the Christian faith. No, he responds with the boldness. In Psalm 3, he responds, But our God is in heaven. He does whatever he pleases. Our psalmist responds in a way where he's perplexed by this question, where he's shocked even, where he finds their question laughable. Where is our God? What are you talking about? See, the psalmist understood very well that God is in these trials. He understood very well that the God had his, that God has his hand over these trials. The psalmist understood very well that God was in control and sovereign over all of these trials. You see in Amos chapter 3, the, 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 the writer re, uh, reads... Does disaster come to a city unless the Lord has done it? Disaster. It is the Lord that had brought disaster to the city. Job, as he was covered in sores and boils, as his children were taken from him, as his wealth and material were taken from him, as his friends and his wife even sat there and questioned him and said, where is your God? Just recant. Curse your God and die. Job responds, no. My God has his hand in this. Yes, Job questioned and Job needed to be confronted for his questioning of God. But never did he turn from him. As King David in Psalm 42, you know, he's gone through his trial and his soul is cast down. He continues to cry out to God. He even says, God, even though your waves and your billows crash over me. He understood that the trial that he was going through was brought to him by God. And even though his soul was cast down, And he didn't feel like worshipping God. He didn't feel like God was close by. He understood that God was there. Just as our psalmist does. And Paul in Romans chapter 8 writes, And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. You see, church, if all things are to work for good, all things, that must mean God's in control of the bad things. That must mean God's in control of the hard things. That must mean God is in control of the evil things that we deal with. But there is purpose. The psalmist understands this. As the psalmist says, our God is in the heavens. And he does whatever he pleases. It doesn't seem like he's close by in these times because he chooses for it to be that way. 
But church, when God is not close by, when it doesn't seem like he is close by, that is when he's closest. And the psalmist continues on to respond to this folly question. The psalmist continues on to respond, and now he goes on the attack. And he's in, in his response to the heathen. In verse 4 he says, Their idols are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. Heathen, what are you talking about? Our God is working. Your God is silver and gold. Your God has been formed and created by your hands. I see your God. They sit before me. They sit there blind, deaf and dumb. They are made by your hands. They are silver and gold. You no longer worship the, the creator. You now worship the creation. They have mouths, but they do not speak. They have eyes, but they do not see. You've given them hands, but they do not handle. You have given them feet, but they do not walk. Yet you question us, where is our God? How dare they? How dare they question the sovereign, mighty king? Their idols are dead. Now, church, in our day and age, in our context, in our society, our heathens or our, those that reject and despise our God don't worship by idols made of gold and silver. No, they've turned to worship other things that they have created. They worship the government. The government is now their God. Or they worship um, medical practitioners. Or they worship medicine. Or they worship mysticism and the universe. And they, they say things like, you know, speak things into existence. And sadly, this has even infected churches. Where they believe that their prayers are speaking things into their existence. And they've become little G gods. Church, these are what we are facing today. Now let me um, qualify some things. I'm not saying that the government is bad. I'm not saying that medical practitioners are bad. I'm not saying that medicine is bad. God ordains governments, Romans chapter 13. God has given men intellect and wisdom to form medicine, to be able to perform surgeries, to heal us, to prolong our life, to take care of us. This is a comfort. But church, God should be worshipped for this. When our government strays, we should turn to God. When our government does a good thing, we should turn to God. Church, when the medicine works or the surgery is pulled off, we don't worship doctors. We don't worship medical practitioners. But we worship God. The psalmist is just expounding a principle of the law provided to us by Moses in Exodus chapter 30 and verse 3. Where Moses says, you shall have no other gods before me. Church, it is not the fact that these creations are wrong. It is the fact that we worship them or we trust in them rather than God. We consider Daniel. I'm sorry. Um, the, the psalmist goes on and he tells us, you know, what should our response be? What should the response be to those that are believers? What should the response be to these heathens, to these pagans, to these that reject God and question our God, even though they worship things that are created by their hands? In Psalm 115 and verse 9, the psalmist writes, O Israel, trust in the Lord. He is their help in their shield. O house of Aaron, trust in the Lord. 
He is their help and their shield. You who fear the Lord, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. See, church, unlike the heathen that put their trust in silver and gold, or that put their trust in governments and medicines, or put their trust in the creation rather than the creator, the psalmist is calling us to trust in the sovereign God who forms all things. He calls us to not just say it, but to put our words and our faith in action. He says, for those that trust in the God, meaning for those that profess to trust in God, don't just say it, live it. In the hard times, in the times where God doesn't seem close by, put your trust in Him. Put your confidence in Him. And why, church, why should be this be our response? You see, the character of God is enough. The appeal made at the beginning should sell our hearts for His favour, for His mercy, for His truth, for His unchangeable. That should be enough. But if our God wasn't merciful enough, if our God wasn't um, loving enough, He promises us even more. In verse 12, the psalmist writes, The Lord has been mindful of us. He will bless us. He will bless the house of Israel. He will bless the house of Aaron. He will bless those who fear the Lord both small and great. May the Lord give you increase more and more and your children. May you be blessed by the Lord who made the heaven and earth. He calls us to respond in faith and trust in Him. Because trusting in God is what brings forth blessing. Trusting in God is what brings forth blessing. When that medicine works, it's trusting in God that brings forth blessing. When the government passes a law that, that glorifies and honours or uplifts our scripture, that's what brings forth blessing to the people of God. When we trust in Him. You may ask, church, what is this blessing? What is this blessing that the psalmist or that God is promising us through His Word? To be honest, I don't know. I don't know what the blessing is. But if we look at the three companions of Daniel, if we look at Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, as they were grabbed, bounded and cast into a fiery furnace that killed the soldiers that got close to the furnace, that killed the soldiers that even cast them into it. There was blessing there. The fact that they were protected. That that flame didn't even leave a smell on them. That that flame didn't even affect their clothing. It didn't burn a hair on their head. And it caused King Nebuchadnezzar to turn and to say, What have I done? Allow these men, allow these men and all other men to worship their God. <coughs> if we consider Moses and, his, and the Israelites that had fled Egypt as they were sitting there, fearful and scared as this great and mighty army came up behind them, as God commanded Moses to cast his staff on the ground and the Red Sea split into two, allowing safety and protection and passageway for his people. And that trust of those that were there was protection. Because as that mighty army came behind them, as they, as they ran up after them, those mighty waters, that great sea came and collapsed down upon them, killing, killing Pharaoh and his mighty army, protecting his people. As we consider Paul and Silas as they were 
bound, shackled and chained in that filthy prison as rats and mice, you know, ran about them in their own filth and the filth of others. As those that were sitting there in the comfort of their homes were saying, where is your God? A great and mighty earthquake comes, releasing Paul and Silas, giving them the ability to run away if they wanted to. And let's be honest, no one here would blame them. I wouldn't have. But their faithfulness kept them there. Their faithfulness opened opportunity for them to preach to the jailer, having the jailer and his household saved. And in that there is the blessing of God, souls saved. Church, I don't know what the blessing of God might be from your trial. It might be salvation. It might be sanctification. It might be a family member getting saved. It might be health. It might be, you know, a a church blessing. It might be, you know, God adding those to the church. It might be, you know, people getting baptized, whatever it might be. There is blessing. It is promised if we trust in God. In, In my own situation, it was the faithfulness of God that allowed me and my wife to continue to trust in Him giving us our our daughter. And in that, you know, it's it's opened up opportunity of discussion that never would have been opened up before. It's led to souls being saved. It's led to, you know, a complete different way that my son can be raised and a love that, you know, that he can see that, you know, maybe other children might not get to see to a later age. There was... Church blessing, it brought my church closer together. It gave us a reason and allowed us to pray as one. Bringing us together, bringing us closer to God and closer to each other. It brought us unity and love for one another. There's blessing there, blessings that I can't even consider. And it gave my daughter even blessing of life and chance and opportunity. The psalmist ends the psalm and he takes, you know, his, his, his target or his aim off the heathen and he gives a final appeal in verse 16 to 18 where God's word reads, The heaven, even the heavens are the Lord's, but the earth he has given to the children of men. The dead do not praise the Lord nor any who go down into silence. But we will bless the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. Praise the Lord. See, church, what the psalmist is saying is God controls and is sovereign over the heavens, also of the earth, so much so that it was the earth for his to give. We didn't take it. We didn't earn it. We didn't receive it. But God has given his children, his people, the earth. And he's given us this earth to create, to build, to cultivate, and to have dominion over. And it is in these actions... It is in our ability to create and have dominion over this earth in a way that we should do it that pleases and glorifies God. We should do this in a way that that brings forth praise and worship to God. You see, the psalmist says that there will come a time when we will die. And when we die, our souls may be lifted up But our body, our flesh, our physical being will go back to the dust. Go to the grave. And when our bodies are in the grave, yes, our souls will be with the Father, worshipping forevermore, yes. But we will not have opportunity to worship and praise God 
on this earth that he has given us again. He's given this, us this earth and we're only here for a set amount of time and during this time that we're here, we ought to praise God. Through all seasons of life, in all situations, for all reasons, for all purposes, let us not be like the, the blind and the deaf. Let us not be like the heathen that have created golden images and trust in them. As the psalmist says, those that have created them are just like them. The psalmist is saying that those that have created them are dead, just as they are dead. They are void of all spiritual life and usefulness. Let us not be like the heathen. Let us worship God, let us praise God on this earth. While we are gathering together as local congregations, while we are husband and wife and children, all with family, let us worship God. Amen. Let's pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, Lord God. We thank you for your grace and your truths. We thank you for your, your mercies and your loving kindness. We thank you for who you are, Lord God. And we pray, Father, that we continuously lean and rely on Christ, our Saviour. And we always consider this gospel that you have redeemed us with. And that you always, in all scenarios, in all situations, burden our hearts to praise and worship you. That in all hardship, in all trial and temptation, that we seek your glory, that we seek your honour and not our own. We thank you, Father, and we pray that you can form us into the likeness of Christ, as this psalmist had called, that we have nothing before you, and that we worship you as Christ worshipped you on this earth. We thank you, God, and pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.